Thanks for joining us today. I pray this week's sermon will guide you into a deeper understanding of the greatest news in the entire world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We value the local church at Central Baptist. So while we are thrilled that you are streaming this sermon, we also want to make sure that this never replaces your commitment to the local body of believers. If you are in the Maysville area, I am personally inviting you to be a guest at one of our weekly services. Come and join us. I promise you will love it. We are a church committed to loving God, loving each other, and loving our world. So if God is using this to impact your life, please consider partnering with us in spreading the message of Jesus to everyone on the earth. I hope this service helps to fix your eyes on Jesus and drives you deeper into the gospel. Have you ever known a person, and maybe you are this kind of person, and don't raise your hand, but always has the best of intentions, but you don't always follow through with, with those intentions. You may make plans to, to go out together with friends, but at the very last second you end up canceling those plans. Or maybe you, you offer to do something for someone else, but yet you never end up, end up following through with that. You know, there's a, a game that I remember as a, as a kid that we would play called Psych. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that game, but it's, it's, you would offer something to, to someone else. So maybe you say, you know what, I'm going to give you, you know, $10. And then when they say, oh yeah, and then you say, Psych, sorry. And then they get mad at you. And, uh, because it is not fulfilling the promise that you had made. You get somebody's hopes up that something is going to happen, but then, At the last moment, they realized that it was a falsehood. Well, this morning, we are continuing our series in the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Thankfully, uh, God always keeps his promises. We don't have to worry about when we get to, to the, the, the height of the moment for God to say, psych, it's not really going to happen. And we see that exhibited here in our passage this morning when God from the ages past has promised that he is going to send his Holy Spirit to come down to dwell in the hearts of his people. And you can take it to the bank. If God says it's going to happen, it is going to happen. So in in Acts chapter 2, we are going to be looking at the entire chapter. And don't worry, we're not going to look at every single word and every single verse in this chapter. But I do want us to, to, to hit several key points in this passage. It may be one of the more well-known passages in all of Scripture, for it is Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is a Jewish holiday. It is the second Jewish holiday in the Jewish calendar, and it literally means 50th. And because the Pentecost comes 50 days after the first holiday of the year, which is Passover. And this falls in a timeline with Jesus' death and his resurrection, for we know that Jesus died at the time of, of Passover, and he came back in his glorified state and dwelt on earth and became, uh, shown himself to the witnesses, some 500 witnesses that he shown himself to. And then, after the end of 40 days, he ascended back into heaven. And before he did that, if you remember back to a couple of weeks ago, he told his apostles to go and to wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come back. Now, I can't imagine what those 10, 12 days or so must have been like for those apostles. For they are gathered and some of the women are gathered there to do together in Jesus' family and they're, they're, they're all there and they are just waiting. I don't, I couldn't imagine what's going through their, their mind. Are they thinking? I mean, is this Jesus, is he really going to send his Holy Spirit to come upon us? I mean, what's it going to look like? 
How are we going to, to, to feel all of the thoughts that are coming? And then they're wondering, what are people out looking for us to, to kill us? Because if you remember, Peter denied Christ because he feared for his very life. But then it happened. And it happened in verse 1. We see that all of them were together, all the apostles, in one place. And from a couple of weeks ago, we know that is a roughly 120 people were in that upper room. And then suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house that they were sitting now this verse is full of, of symbols here. We see a mighty rushing wind and the spirit is often referred to as a, a wind and it filled their entire house. And then they began speaking in, as my translation says, in tongues. Now this is a different type of tongue than we might see in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul is addressing them. Basically it means that they were speaking in different languages. What's interesting is they're speaking in languages that they did not know. And they were divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested in each one of them. Now fire is a symbol of the very presence of of God. We see that in, in the book, uh, in, with, with Moses and the burning bush. God told him to take off his shoes because he was in the very presence of God. Fire also has a, a purifying effect. This holiness of God was there among them through the Holy Spirit. And then all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So these, these 120 apostles, every single, or disciples, every single one of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in languages that they did not even know. But they didn't speak on their own. They only spoke what the Spirit gave them. Now they did this for a specific purpose. Because at Pentecost, it was a festival, so multitudes of people were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday at the temple. People from the entire world, what we call the Jerusalem diaspora, people from all the way from Rome down to Africa, people from every nation were coming to Jerusalem for this festival. And these Jews from all around the world spoke different languages. And so they were all there, men from every nation under heaven. And as this multitude came together, each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they heard the mighty works of God. Now this is a, 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 a miraculous uh, event that to our knowledge has not happened since then. But God's specific purpose was to unite the world through the Holy Spirit. And all of these, these uh, thousands and multitudes of people came together and they heard the very word of God in his own native language. And if you or I were there, we would probably have the same thought as, as, as the, the, the pilgrims that came to Jerusalem. They asked, are these guys drunk? Because what they're doing makes no sense to us. In verse, uh, in verse 13, it says others, they mocked him and they said, they are filled with new wine. Now, this is an interesting comment that they would make because it's at 9 o'clock in the morning. And, and Peter will explain later that, no, these men are, are not, uh, not under the influence of, of alcohol. But no, they are indeed filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see that the gospel has come not just for the Hebrews, those that, that speak the Hebrew or Aramaic language or even, even Greek, but that the gospel has come for every nation, every 
language. And it was preached to them in a language that they could understand as well. And then we move on to uh, Peter's sermon, probably his most famous sermon that he gave. He gave a few others uh, throughout, we see in the book of Acts as well. But this is one that that has kind of given him his claim to to fame. So let's look at Peter's sermon, beginning in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, meaning the apostles, lifted up his voice and addressed them. It says, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now one thing we can see about Peter's sermon is that he is not making things up. His sermon is references Old Testament passages. We see the the the, the prophet Joel here, and then we're going to see later on uh, from uh, from David in the book of of Psalms. And that's one thing that we need to take hold of even to today is that when the word of God is preached, it needs to be saturated by the actual word. Preaching is not someone's opinion. It's not some, some tips for you to how to better your life. No, when we preach the word of God, it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and it has the power to change lives. And it requires a response. You know, I'm sure you've encountered believers like this, but you can tell that they are filled with the Holy Spirit because oftentimes when they speak, the word of God comes from their mouth. Remember, uh, Brother Bob, a former pastor of, of mine that I got to, to, to serve under. And oftentimes we would go out visiting people. And as we were sitting in the home and, and a different topic would come up and he would almost always quote scripture to them. He didn't pull out his, his Bible and, and flip to, to certain pages. He, he didn't pull out his phone and pull up his Bible app and, and, and look at, you know, all right, what does somebody that's struggling with grief, what verses do I need to, to read to them? No, you could tell that this man knew the Word of God. Because it is the Word of God through the Holy Spirit that gives us fuel. See, Peter, when he's preaching odds are he doesn't he he didn't have his his sermon manuscript written out and give everything with exact detail no he when he spoke the word of god just moved through him and that oh is something that i desire to have happen in my own life is when when you speak that the word of god just comes to you and that only comes through studying through meditating on God's word and through memorizing God's word. But Peter also spoke in words that these Jews would understand. For they are men of the Old Testament. That is their book. And they knew it and they knew it well. Um, Some had the entire Old Testament memorized. So when Jesus, or when, when Peter is quoting the prophet Joel, Pick it up in verse 17. He says, and in the last days it shall be. Now the last days started at Pentecost and we are still some 2,000 years later in these last days. And he says, it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prosper prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy now oftentimes we think of prophecy as somebody telling a future telling all right kind of as a as a fortune teller type of thing and and while that is the case and many of the old testament prophets as did tell the future as we saw with Joseph in our children's story this morning being able to interpret dreams but basically the word prophesy means to speak truth 
So what Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit has come into the hearts of every single believer, not just the preacher, not just the apostles, not just our deacons, but to every single believer. And you have the power to speak truth. It continues on, and I will show wonders in the heavens and above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Prophet Joel is foretelling of the end of times when the day of the Lord comes and it will be unmistakable when that day happens. But Joel, hundreds of years before the day of Pentecost, is telling them the very thing that has happened at that moment that the Spirit will come and it will fill them. And then, verse 21, probably the climax of this passage, it says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel is not just for the Jews. The gospel is... It's not just for those people who were alive and walked with Jesus. The gospel is not for white middle class people. No, the gospel is for every single person. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter is going to unpack that even more so as he uh, continues on in his sermon. And he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to your God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves already know. So Peter here, he says, Jesus of Nazareth is kind of giving him clarification of where he is from. As we know, can anything good come from Nazareth? He said he is a, a man. It's important that we recognize the humanity of Jesus, that he came and he walked among us, that he suffered as we suffered, but yet he was not like us. And we'll see later that Peter talks about Jesus' divinity as well. Jesus came and he did mighty wonders and works. He did miracles and many of them saw them and if they didn't see them themselves and they at least heard about these miracles that were done as they already know. And he said, 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless men. Peter is not giving a politically correct speech at this this moment. In fact, he is accusing all of the men and women that are assembled before him as they themselves killing Jesus. We see and talked about it before, this, this tension all throughout Scripture between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And we see that That here is that it says that that according to God's definite plan, right? The plan that we are on now is God's plan A. There is no backup plan. There is no plan B. From the foundation of the world, we are living in God's plan. But yet, at the same time, they, those that killed Jesus, are held responsible. Now, there, in today's time, there is uh, this uh, th- talk of uh, what's called fatalism. Basically, is that everything is set in motion. Everything is going to, to happen, is going to, to happen. We have no choice in, in the matter. We, we see that in, in things of, you know, somebody, we, we, in, in doing so, it, it relieves us of responsibility. So we begin to make excuses for our actions. It's based on how I was brought up. I was brought up in a a bad home. So I'm not responsible for the bad things that I might do. Or I might be under the influence of some type of substance. So I'm not responsible for what I, I do. But what God shows us in this passage and 
be honest, I don't fully understand it, and I'm not sure we can, this side of heaven, is that even within God's perfect plan, that we are responsible for the actions that are carried out. We saw this with Judas. Jesus says that one of you is going to betray me, but yet, and it was Judas who did so, but yet he, he killed himself because of the guilt he had for betraying his Christ. And we see that the Jews there that Peter is saying they crucified and killed Jesus because they are lawless men and this even applies to us today in 2019. We are responsible for the death of Jesus because it is our sin that held him there on the cross. And apart from Christ, we too are lawless men. That's the bad news. But thankfully, Peter gets to the good news. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus had to come back to life. This is the linchpin of of Christianity. As uh, Roger read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Jesus did not come back to life from the dead, then we are to be pitied. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no gospel. God did, in fact, raise him up. And then Peter moves on to to David. He says, for David said, says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad. And my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of the gladness with your presence. And it's important that Peter speaks of, of David Because if you remember, these Jews are waiting for the promised Messiah, whom the Old Testament says will come from the lineage of David. So what Peter is saying, continue on to 29, brothers, I may say to you with confidence, right? He's not making an opinion. He's not saying it could possibly be this. No, with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, And his tomb is with us to this day. The man that they revered, David, was dead and they could go to his gravestone on the south side of Jerusalem. He says, being therefore a prophet, David, and knowing that God had sworn with, with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, they saw the risen Jesus. Then 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, the second highest position in all of the universe, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. See, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to see God for who he truly is. That's why as believers, we read the Bible differently than someone who is just reading it as a piece of literature. There is power in the word of God and it is through the Holy Spirit that we can see him for who he truly is. For David did not ascend to the heavens. The man they revered did not go into heaven. Now, obviously, His body did not ascend to heaven. His soul did ascend to to heaven as ours do this day. It says, but he himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ 
the Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, when the multitudes heard what Peter had been preaching, they were cut to the heart. Now, has the word of God ever done that to you? Whether you're, you're reading it in, in written form or you're hearing the word of God proclaimed, has it ever cut you to the heart? The, Jonathan Edwards, one of the leaders in the, in the first great awakening, came to faith in Christ. Not by somebody sitting at his kitchen table sharing the gospel with him. Not by hearing a sermon but by reading the word of God. The words in scripture cut him to the heart. See, the word does that. It pierces our hearts and it calls for a response. We must respond to the word of God. So and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, the multitude did this. They say, brothers, what shall we do? I find it interesting that, that, that these, these multitudes, the Jews that, that were there, they did not wait for the end of Peter's sermon, wait for the invitation to him to come before they walked forward and made a response. In the midst of Peter's sermon, they say, hey, wait, wait, what shall we do? And Peter responds. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we see you to repent and be baptized. Those are important words. Now, we don't see the word believe. Now, we as faithful Christians know that we must believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is implied even though it is not written explicitly here. Now, our, our friends who believe that baptism is a part of sal- is necessary for salvation will often turn to this passage where it says, repent and be baptized. Now, in other parts of the book of Acts, it's not listed there. And in, in fact, um, um, the theologians will, will say that we are to repent and we are baptized on our faith in Christ in that belief. So we we do not believe that that you must be baptized in order to be saved, for we do not believe that any works can save us. But yet, baptism is very important. We believe in what's called believer's baptism. The baptism is the outward expression of what has transformed in your heart. It is essential to salvation, but it does not save you itself. But we are to repent We are to turn from our sin and turn to God. Now, repentance is is a word that we do not often talk about. Usually in sharing the gospel, we'll say, you know, Jesus loves you and he has a great plan for your life. He died for your sins and you just need to give your life to him and, 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 and trust in him. And yes, that is very much a part of it. But to be saved, we are to no longer live the way we lived before. We are to turn from that sin and turn to Christ. And in doing so, it starts with the heart. Our hearts are no longer our own fleshly, sinful, desirous hearts, but our hearts are to be in line with that of of Christ. And so often, though, we we tend because we we don't feel like we want to, to judge someone, and I think it's appropriate, we let the word of God judge, but yet, we, we move past it and say, well, yes, I mean, you're, you're saved, but you're still going to sin, as if we, we mean that it's okay to sin. It is never okay to sin, all right? But yet, we still are sinful human beings. We will not be fully sanctified, fully glorified, till we are in heaven with Christ himself. But that still doesn't mean that it is okay for us to sin. See, I think some of us are here this morning, And we've given God our hearts. Well, we've given him most of it. But yet we still have that that pet sin in our life that we're just not willing to let go of. 
We keep stroking it. We keep feeding it. We keep fueling it. But we are not to just repent mostly. We are to repent fully. I've got a, a cat that's been running around the church. I don't know what his name is. He's kind of orange, so I call him Garfield. Oftentimes I'll see him in the, in the trash when I come to church. Sometimes he's over in uh, by the parsonage. And one day I was joking with, with Jess and, and said that we've got a new cat and we not huge fans of cats, but uh, it's okay if you are. God bless you. Um, but... Um, <laughs> And, and I jokingly said, well, uh, you know, he's, he's looking for food, so I, I just fed him. And she said, you better not have fed him or you're going to be the one that's going to be out looking for food. <laughs> because what happens if you feed a cat? <laughs> it ain't ever going away. It's your cat whether you bought him or not. Oftentimes we do that with sin. We just feed that, that sin. We just let it. Just kind of sit there. It may not take off, take up our entire heart. But yet you know that that is keeping you from living the life that God has called you to live. We are to repent and be baptized. Everyone for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we do that, then we will, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not a, a spiritual gift that some are filled with the Holy Spirit. No, it applies to every single believer. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Now, we are not saved through our parents or grandparents. Every single one is saved only through repentance, faith, and and, and repentance and faith, and then the outpouring of that is baptism. But the gospel is for, for the people who are far off. The gospel is for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. We don't go out and, and find God. He finds us. And we submit our lives to him and his glorious plan that he has for us. So Peter keeps on, on preaching. This is not the end of his sermon. We don't have his full sermon here. Luke decided uh, not to include that. I don't know if he cut out the, the bad parts or what, but, but uh, what he's given us is, is dynamite here. But we see the, the result of his sermon. It says that, So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine what that must have been like? 3,000 people were pierced their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of the word of God. And they gave their lives to Christ. And what did they do? Well, verses 43, 42 through 47, we we see the result of our salvation, how we as Christians are called to live. In verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So as Christians, we are called to listen. Right, we need to listen to the word of God that is taught you need to uh, listen and, as we often say with our children, obey. It's not enough just to know the word of God. We are to obey the word of God. So when we read the Bible, we are to, 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 uh, we are to apply it to our life. We are to apply what is heard every Sunday and when our Bible studies, we are to treat the word of God as it is, the living, breathing authoritative word of God. We are to be in fellowship with other believers. Now this happens in, in multiple ways. It means the regular gathering of God's people for worship. If worship, coming to worship is not a priority in your life, you are not living the life that God has called you to live. 
If you are not spending time in God's word through a Sunday school class or and through another type of Bible study, you are not living the life that God has given you. We are also to be in fellowship with one another outside of, of the walls of, of this church. Nowadays, our, our homes are kind of our, our fortress. It's the way where we can go and, and escape from, from the world. Many times now, we don't even really know the names of our, our neighbors and, and those around us. And that, interesting, is very different than how the early church lived. They lived in fellowship with one another. And they were the breaking of bread and prayers. And we joke about Baptists. We, we know how to eat. We you know, had fried chicken and our, uh, our potluck meals. But there's something powerful about sharing a meal with someone else. It kind of takes our, our guard down. and makes us a little more, uh, a little more open to, to hearing and to fellowshipping with each other. And it gives you an amazing opportunity to share the gospel. Are you allowing your your neighbors and, and those that, um, that, that, that you live in your everyday life, are you allowing them into your life so that you may be able to pour the Bible into their life? And 40, 43, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Through the Holy Spirit, the apostles had the power to do miracles, and they did so, so that people may believe and put faith in Christ. And it says, and all together, or all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, some people will point to this and say that the Bible advocates for communism, right? And that is a misinterpretation of this passage for a number of reasons. One is that it is not the government coming in and forcing uh, the, the church to give up all of their possessions, No, they are willingly giving up everything that they have. And 45 says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. The principle we need to take from this is that that the early church was very generous with what they had. They didn't cling to their possessions. They gave faithfully so that no one had any need. Are you generous with what you have, with what God has blessed you with? Sometimes we think, oh, this is, I have earned this. And I'll give some, but I'm not going to give as much as I should. My encouragement to you this morning is, is to listen to the Holy Spirit. How is he calling you to give, whether that be financially, whether that be Sharing of your, your home to allow others to come into it, to fellowship with you. Maybe it's giving of, of your time. We can be very selfish with our, our time. How are you using your time for the Lord? Let me see in 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. And I've said several times that, that, uh, that nowadays that, that, that people don't go to church as much as they, as they used to. You know, used to, if the, you know, the church was open, you were there, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival service, you were, you were there. Uh, you know, it, even you would just drive by the church and see, well, if the lights are on, something must be going on, so I need to, 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 to stop and, and, and see what I'm missing out on. So, uh, Charles Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers back in the 18th or 1800s. They would have services every single day. He was preaching seven sermons a week. I'm definitely not advocating for, for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think how we live our lives today is, is very differently than how the early church lived. And I'm not saying that we, that we need to every waking moment be at, at, at church. But I think it's, it's the same with repentance. It's a matter of our hearts. And we see in verse 46 that they had glad and generous hearts. How is your heart this morning? Some of us have wounded hearts. 
We've been hurt. Maybe we've been hurt by, by the church, by Christians, people who claim to be a follower of Christ, but yet through their words or through their actions seek to destroy people. Maybe you've been, been hurt by just tough circumstances. What about you? But life can be hard. And in fact, the Bible tells us that for those in Christ, it is going to be difficult. But even through difficulty, we can still have glad hearts. Because our salvation is not in what happens to us here on earth. But our salvation is This is what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on that cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. And now, this is the hope we have. He is is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and we are promised that he will return one day and when he does, we will join with him. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more tears. We have hope that it will come to fulfillment. And that, brothers and sisters, is what gives us glad and generous hearts. Praising the God and having favor with all people. And the result of the first church's faith, we see in verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So many of our churches today are are closing their doors. And if you look at the numbers and statistics, and I've looked at them all, is one common thing that you see in all of them is that people are not being saved. It can come from a variety of, of reasons, but to break it down is we're not sharing our faith like we should. Churches aren't proclaiming the gospel from the pulpit. We're not sharing it in our everyday lives. It is not a focus of us. Sometimes we try to force it. But we see the early church, they weren't forcing the gospel. No, it was just an outpouring of their hearts because they had that glad and generous heart. And God rewarded them that day because he increased their number day by day. I don't know about you. My prayer is that God would increase our numbers day by day. Not so that we might boast and say how great of a job that we're doing. Not that we might get some award at the convention. And they do. They give awards for churches that have the most baptisms. And that's a good thing. But we know that people are crossing over from death to life. We do so for God's glory. So as we close this morning, my prayer is is that that one, if you have not yet put your faith in Christ, repent, believe. For the gospel is for you if you will call on the name of the Lord. He will save you. Do so today. For others of us, we are sitting here this morning. We're not really living a life filled with the Holy Spirit. And I can't tell you why that is. You just need to have a come to Jesus meeting with Him. Let me tell you, you don't need to just hear Him. But you've got to listen. And you need to obey. For some of us, that means that we've got to cast aside that pet sin that we've got. We've got to get rid of it because God demands our total allegiance, not just part of it. Others of us are scared of living in the Spirit because we don't know what God is going to call us to do. It may make us uncomfortable and probably will. But let me tell you, when you are living fully in the Holy Spirit, there is nothing like it. Your life will never be greater. 
But we don't even do it for ourselves. We do it for what he has done for us and for what our hope will bring in the future. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Just in awe of who you are. Your, the, the, the fire that you have ascended, that you have, we have seen throughout Scripture, your presence. They're sending the Holy Spirit as a mighty rushing wind. God, we are grateful that we can see in the pages of Scripture that, that you always have fulfilled your promises. That what you aim and seek to do, you will accomplish it. We need to never doubt you. God, we're thankful that you really did send your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that that he was buried and that he rose from the dead on that third day, that he appeared to the multitudes, over 500 people. God, we we don't have a faith that is built on a figment of someone's imagination. No, God, it is built in historical events that truly happened. You did so to fulfill the promises that you made millennia ago. God, we know that the words that Peter preached at Pentecost are just as true today as they were then. God, I pray that we would be a people that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that that Holy Spirit would exude from us That our church would be, that the spirit would just be swirling around this place and it would motivate us to live the life that you have called each and every one of us to live. And we do so for your glory, that your name would be made known among the nations for the gospel is not just for us that have already heard it, but it is for every single person that has yet to hear God, I pray that the gospel will be taken to the people here in the East End of Maysville, around our state, around our country, to the utter ends of the earth. For it is news that is too good to be hidden. God, I pray that we would exude it with every ounce of our being. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God is inviting you to be part of the story He is writing throughout the ages to come. He is offering salvation to you today, which is your invitation to the rescue that God offers. You can embrace the rescue of God by simply admitting your need to God, asking Him to forgive you, trusting in Jesus alone to rescue you, and following Jesus Christ, the King of your life in faith from this day forward. If you would like to give your life to Jesus, go to God in prayer right now and confess your need for Him and that you choose to follow Him. If you have chosen to follow Jesus, please let us know. We want to continue to pray for you and to send you some resources to help you to grow in your faith. I hope you enjoyed this sermon and I look forward to seeing you soon in person at one of our weekly services. Hey, could you do me a favor? Please like our Facebook page and share a comment on the things that we post. It's Central Baptist Church Maysville, Kentucky, because it helps others to hear about Jesus. God bless.